Good evening. I now call to order the April 8th, 2024 meeting of the East Bend School District Board of School Directors. You know, all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. States of America, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's make a quick note that Ms. Ford is joining us uh, by Zoom this evening. Um, item D, under meeting opening, uh, we had a presentation planned for this evening, but it's going to be delayed to a future meeting. Uh, to my knowledge, we have no request to address the board this evening. Uh, so the first, first item we'll tackle is the approval of minutes for the March 25th meeting. Motion. Moved. Second. Any comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, is Alan please call the roll? Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Pelaghi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. 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 Thank you, Ms. Allen. I'm moving on to the district update. Dr. Campbell. We have many student and staff accomplishments that, we, that I'd like to start off with this evening. First, I'd like to congratulate Lower McCungy Middle School, specifically their What's So Cool About Manufacturing team. I mentioned at our last meeting that voting was open for the video contests, and we're really excited to share that LMMS and their What's So Cool About Manufacturing team won the award for the outstanding creativity for their video. Um, and so we're appreciative of Jalabu USA, who is the organization or the business with whom our students at LMMS partnered as part of their video production. We, I'd also like to um, recognize many people in the organization um, as a result in East Penn being recognized as one of the best communities in the nation for music education. And that recognition comes from the National Association of Music Merchants. And so this award really recognizes um, and celebrates the outstanding efforts, first and foremost, of our teachers in our music program, as well as administrators, parents, um, students and community leaders who ultimately continue to demonstrate a strong commitment to the musical um, and performing arts in East Penn. I'd also like to congratulate several groups of students from Emmaus High School, again, all musicians. They were recently um, honored through District 10, uh, PMEA, various honor ensembles. Specifically, the following students were recognized as members of district band, including Stavros Marangos, Clara Izom, Marley Llewellyn, and Vivian Zong. Members who were recognized as part of district orchestra include Vivian Song, Claire Isom, Isaiah Elcock, Nicholas Maroon, Claire Sheehan, Anna Chavoya, Zining Fan, Brandon Larico, Elena Tang, and Bo Yao, Brighton Yu, and Colby Zhang. And then advancing to regional chorus, Anna Chavoya, Haley Kavaki, Hannah Kern, Naomi Sharpless, Ryan Begg, Thomas and Thomas McDonald. In regional band, Vivian Zong. In regional orchestra, Vivian Zong, Claire Izom, Isaiah Elcock, Nicholas Maroon, Brandon Larico, Elena Tang, and Bo Yao, Brighton Yu, and Colby Zhang. Again, you hear that many students advance to both districts as well as regionals. And finally, EHS students who were recognized at the state level in all state chorus, Anna Chavoya, all-State Wind Ensemble, Vivian Zong, and All-State Orchestra, Elena Tang and Clara Izom. So that's a phenomenal accomplishment for many musicians at Emmaus High School, and we're very proud of them. We also, there were 12 LCTI students who recently medaled at the Pennsylvania FCCLA State Leadership Conference. And we had two state medalists who attend LCTI who are Emmaus High School students. And I, uh, we would like to offer a huge congratulations to Julia Jones, who was a gold medal winner in cake decorating, and also Ella Trexler, another gold medal winner in cake decorating. Maybe we should ask them to bring their work to us. Mm -hmm. 
We're also incredibly proud of the fact that there were several competitors from LCTI who participated in the 45th annual Penn Future Health Professionals State Conference. Emmaus High School students, Caitlin Butsavage, Vivian Pinochi reitzman and Carolyn Schutz placed second in the creative problem solving event through that state conference. And we're very proud of those three EHS students. They're part of the LCTI Emerging Health Program. And as a result of their strong performance at the state conference, they now have an opportunity to travel to Texas this summer for the International Leadership Conference. So we wish them well there. I'd also like to thank many of the community members who came out this past Saturday to participate in the, in the 50th anniversary celebration of Iyer Middle School. It was great to have, first we had some student performers from Iyer Middle School. Um, we had some of our student council and or honor society students who gave tours of the building. And what was probably most rewarding is that we had some former Iyer administrators as well as teachers who have since retired, but came back to share um, just their fond memories that they still have of Iyer and their work there, um, again, some 20, 30 years ago. So thanks again to everyone for coming out to make that a special event. I'd also like to recognize um, at our last board meeting, I highlighted the fact that we were wrapping up our spring theater season in the district, specifically our middle school and high school theater performances have had concluded. We're looking forward to the Freddie Awards for our high school students. And just last Friday and over the weekend, Albertus Elementary performed their rendition of The Wizard of Oz. It was an absolutely amazing performance. So incredibly proud of our Albertus students. And so I encourage the community to please check out our elementary school websites because many of our other elementary buildings have theater productions that are happening this spring. Um, it really is a great and fun night out for families. A special thank you also goes out to all of our exhibitors who shared their career experiences with our students at our annual East Penn Education Foundation Career Exploration Fair that was held the last week of March. We're especially proud of all of our students who came and, and interacted and learned from and with our career exhibitors. And LMS student Sean Thompson was um, the lucky winner of the AirPods as a result of completing his career fair digital passport um, from the evening. A few upcoming events that I would like to share with the community, specifically um, on April 25th from 6 to 8 p.m., Emmaus High School is sponsoring a college fair. Again, it will be April 25th in the high school gymnasium. We have over 100 college, career and technical and military representatives who will be joining us for an outstanding top-notch event. And also finally on April 25th here at the high school track, Emmaus High School will be sponsoring Shave for the Brave. Um, again, it's our goal to raise $100,000 to fight childhood cancer. I have no doubt that we will exceed that, that goal. And so please check out our school website, our district website to see how you can support that cause. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, item four and the budget, uh, we have a presentation, uh, our first having a presentation on the for part two of the budget priorities. Dr. Campbell, would you like to introduce? Yes, thank you. We can actually switch spots. Thank you. All right, good evening um, to the board and the community members who are perhaps joining us. Um, at this point, we are we are excited to share our second round of priorities that we are proposing 
for the 24-25 school year. We'll focus on those priority, the second set of those um, items this evening. And then following the priority presentation, Mr. Saul will also give a brief budget update. You can see in terms of where we're going, we're certainly coming in on the home stretch of our budget presentations. We will um, ask that the board adopt a proposed final budget at the upcoming meeting in April. And then finally on June 10th, we would have adoption of the final budget. This is a reminder of the priorities. We introduced all of them at the last meeting. You also likely recall that we spent um, the focus of last board meetings presentation was really on those first four priorities. All four of those priorities were similar in that they applied to tier two and tier three supports in the organization as part of our MTSS framework. This evening, we're gonna focus on the remaining seven priorities that are being proposed. And we really see these priorities being a part of our core programs. As I just shared later this evening, after our priority presentation, Mr. Saul is going to share um, a budget update and he will emphasize, and we're emphasizing now that these approximately $2 million in new priorities or new positions are included in the draft of the budget, um, including the updates that you will see later this evening. After some adjustments, you will hear that these priorities included as part of the budget include an approximate 5% tax increase. So that is slightly lower than the, the tax increase that had been included in the previous version of the budget. If all of these priorities, again, are included in the budget, it's about a 5% tax increase. If all of these $2 million in priorities were removed and not moved ahead for next year, the tax increase would be approximately 3.2%. So I just wanted to address where we're at and what the tax increase would look like if these priorities were not included. And so we're gonna get started in terms of taking a look at the request for one school psychologist, a new position to be added to the district for next year and to walk us through this particular priority item, as well as several items, including a special education teachers and instructional assistants. Mrs. Freed, who's our director of special education is going to lead us through the first several priorities. Good evening and thank you, Dr. Campbell. Tonight, I'm going to discuss with you several different priorities that Dr. Campbell just outlined, one of those being a, an additional school psychologist. If you look at slide four, the table on slide four outlines the number of students enrolled per school across the district and the number of school psychologist positions assigned to each school. If you look at Emmaus High School at the bottom, you'll notice that Emmaus High School does have the largest amount of students designated for the district at that building where we have just 1.5 um, school psychologists currently um, at that building. Um, you can see the next highest school is Lower McCunji Middle School with 1,000 students and um, nearly tripling that at the high school. We would like to see more supports, especially with the uptick we've seen in um, mental health needs at the high school level and also the increase in um, special education evaluations that have um, been needed post-pandemic. So our vision is to add one full-time position um, of a school psychologist, which would bring Emmaus High School to um, roughly at least two full-time positions there. It would actually be 2.5 positions. That 0.5 position would primarily be designated at Emmaus High School. However, we do recognize that some of the smaller schools do have just ha have that half-time psychologist. So if there are needs in um, greater evaluations that are needed or functional behavior assessments that could additionally be supported, we would also utilize that 0.5 position at Emmaus High School to help out in any of those situations. But the school psychologist's primary um, purpose at, the, at all of our levels, but they, they primarily do is conduct psychoeducational evaluations under chapter 14 for special education, chapter 15 for gifted education, and chapter 15 for section 504 students. They also conduct functional behavior assessments and complete positive behavior support plans for our students who require behavioral supports in their IEPs. 
They serve as part of the multidisciplinary team to support our multi-tiered system of supports and IEP development. In times of crisis, they support students by conducting risk and threat assessments for mental health needs. They support students individually as, as a related service through IEPs as psychological counseling. They consult with teachers, families, and other mental health professionals to improve support strategies within the school setting. And they also collaborate with community agencies to coordinate outside mental health services beyond the school day. The next two positions I'm going to discuss this evening are proposed positions for two elementary teaching positions. The first teaching position would be an elementary autistic support teacher. The autistic support teachers provide directions instruction to students with disabilities in our autistic support programming using applied behavioral analysis techniques and programs. They also collaborate with our regular education teachers who are students in autistic support are included with um, during times of instruction, whether it's uh, core instruction or in their specials classes, they help to accommodate and modify the general education curriculum. So our students in autistic support have access to that. The second position is a proposed elementary learning support position where our learning support, our learning support teachers provide direct instruction in reading, writing, math, and executive functions to students with disabilities in our learning support programming. They might work with students individually or in small groups in our elementary program in grades K to five in both pullout and inclusive settings. And they too collaborate with regular, regular education teachers to provide accommodations and modifications within the general education curriculum. For the elementary autistic support teacher, um, we currently, all five of our autistic support classrooms are at or near capacity. And what that means is under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, they require that the maximum caseload amount for a full-time or supplemental classroom in autistic support is eight students. So at any given moment throughout this school year, we have either been at capacity or near capacity with student fluctuation with move-ins and moves out, move students moving out of the district. Um, in addition, when you take into account um, the supports that are required in an autistic support programming um, for our students with the greatest needs in behavior, you have to account the amount of individuals who are also in the classroom beyond the students. So it's very common beside the students, the eight students, their classroom teacher, to have you know, anywhere from three to five instructional assistants on top of related service providers in speech, OT and PT, um, and then also behavioral supports, whether it's um, licensed behavior uh, specialists or BCBAs or RBTs that are coming in and out of those classrooms. So sometimes space can be very limited depending on how many students and what services are provided in those classrooms. In addition, we looked at our student enrollment for next year. We have three students who are transitioning out of the elementary autistic support program from going from fifth grade into our middle school program. However, looking at our um, incoming students from early intervention, we are currently slated with approximately 10 students who will be enrolling in kindergarten who do require an autistic support classroom for next year. So it is something that we will be required to provide. When we look at our elementary learning support position, we are proposing that this position be assigned to West Coastville Elementary School. There are currently three learning support teachers at West Coastville Elementary School who provide services across multiple grade levels. Um, and it is very common for those teachers to provide services not just a, across one grade level or two grade levels, but up to three grade levels. So for example, um, they might have up to, you know, some of the teachers may have 19 or 20 students on a caseload, but then be serving students in kindergarten, first grade, and possibly fifth grade and having to juggle the schedules of inclusive set or providing services in inclusive settings of co-taught instruction, as well as pull out interventions um, becomes very difficult with that amount of students across those grade levels, multiple grade levels. 
And lastly, I'm going to speak to the first bullet point under instructional assistance. We are proposing an additional three new positions for our autistic support classroom that I briefly spoke to you about. So each autistic support classroom does require additional support beyond of the classroom teacher um, due to the high level of needs that are provided in academics and behaviors in those classrooms. So we, we are proposing um, three additional um, instructional assistance to provide individual and small group supports to those students. Here is another um, priority that we have identified for the 24-25 school year that related to our instructional assistance. And specifically that priority is to take six current instructional assistant positions and make those positions full-time. And you can see there how we define full-time versus part-time. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of back background briefly. Currently we have 155 instructional assistant positions. These are support staff positions who absolutely are critical in terms of the support that they provide to our students with disabilities across um, all grade levels, kindergarten through 12th grade. Again, currently those 155 positions are part-time and they work, um, typically it's a maximum of 29 hours that they're working. And so we have many situations across the district in which we have to, I think the best way to put it is piece together support staff schedules so that we can provide continuous support to our students in classrooms with the most significant need. And those schedules that we're piecing together ultimately are not always ideal first and foremost for students. Um, we're talking about students who perhaps have significant needs and really do need the greatest amount of consistency in terms of the adults with whom they're working. And so the current constraints of their part-time schedule prevents us from creating that consistency to the greatest extent possible for kids. And then certainly also creates inconsistencies in terms of the partnership between the support staff member and the classroom teacher. Um, certainly you can all appreciate that when I just shared that we have 155 current instructional assistant positions and we're proposing to make six full-time, um, we as, a, as an administrative team, see this as beginning to phase in or introduce some full-time positions. It is, not, it is not our vision that we make all 155 positions full-time, but really to work systematically over the course of several years. And we'll work carefully with our Office of Special Education as well as our building leaders to begin to identify and prioritize which of those positions over the course of several years, ultimately um, we would recommend making full-time, again, first and foremost for the benefit of our students. And so this is the beginning of that process. Um, and certainly, you know, as I explained in terms of how would we identify who those individuals are and in which classrooms, that would be something in which we work collaboratively with our special education department and looking at students' IEPs and needs. Um, and just begin to prioritize how we phase in those positions. Well, um, and again, what we believe this would help us to begin to accomplish is to prioritize those students who are requiring the most intensive level of support, and also to really begin to build that consistency when we think about pairings or partnerships between students and the adults with whom they're working on a daily basis. And at this point, um, I invite Mrs. Gariello, principal, principal of Emmaus High School, who's going to share with the board the request for two teaching positions at Emmaus High School for the upcoming year. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Good evening. So Emmaus High School is requesting an English teacher and a math teacher to be added to the staff. As you know, English is a four credit requirement at the high school for graduation. And it is also a keystone tested subject. So our 10th grade English students um, take their keystone literacy literature test at the end of 10th grade. 
So currently we offer 30 different English classes, including two AP classes and two dual enrollment. One was just added um, and we're excited about that for next year. We feel strongly that we'd like to keep our average class sizes to what was listed on, um, on the slide here. This is a goal. Um, we can't promise anything, but we are shooting for 22 students on average in a co-taught level class, 24 students average in an on-level class, and 28 for our AP and honors classes. Um, this currently is the goal as we build our schedule for next year. Often these numbers do change because of move-ins that come in over the summer and students that need to be reseated after the end of this school year. Probably most importantly though, we're focusing and requesting this teacher because we'd like to um, create the smaller class sizes in order for teachers to be able to differentiate and individualize more, give additional feedback, um, especially with the keys to literacy training, the more um, conferencing and individualized instruction and guiding students through the writing process is critical. critical. And with a smaller class size, we feel that the teachers can spend more time and more specific feedback can be given. We also feel that with a smaller class size, the, the teachers are able to prepare the students better for the Keystone exams and not only Keystone exams, but the AP exams, the SAT exams through additional test prep and practice and time. And of course, as I mentioned, we are implementing and the teachers are being uh, trained right now on keys to literacy strategies. And that re does require um, and, and strongly suggest a lot of uh, conferencing, individual work, feedback on, on writing um, to individual students. Similarly, with the math position, math is a three credit requirement for graduation at Emmaus High School. And as you know, Algebra One is a keystone tested course. And most of our students take Algebra One at the high school in ninth or 10th grade. And then after Algebra Two, for those students who are not proficient on the Keystone exams, they will retest. Um, so Algebra Two also becomes somewhat foundational for the students. Um, and Algebra in general is a foundational course for math in order to move on to the um, other levels and other courses. Currently we offer 27 math courses, including our Comp Sci courses, four AP math classes, five dual enrollment classes, those are up for next school year, and two um, um, AP computer science classes. Again, we want to run all these courses, um, but if enrollment is low, um, we do take a look at that when we're building the schedule. Again, we're trying to keep the similar class size average goals, 22 for co 22, 24 for on-level and 28 for AP and honors classes. And again, that's a goal. Um, and this may have to be adjusted as students have to be reseated in specific classes or move-ins over the summer. In math, however, we know that we need to focus on these critical foundational skills of algebra and provide individualized and specific instruction feedback to our students. Um, as I mentioned earlier, algebra is foundational to all other math courses. We need to address the deficits as outlined in the TSI plan, um, as explained to you in previous board meetings, and provide specific support for each student and um, really base their needs, base the instruction on their needs and specialized, um, specialized needs, and additionally, as shown in our benchmark tests. And then again, as in, in the English class, we feel that the smaller class sizes will allow teachers to better prepare individual students for the Keystone exam, SAT exams, AP exams, ACT exams um, through additional test prep and practice and time and individualized feedback. The final two priorities that we're going to discuss this evening are positions that were planned as part of our staffing needs for the K-8 to realignment. And as a reminder, um, I recognize that we have some new board members with us, but in November of 2023, so just this past fall, the board approved for administration to continue planning for the realignment of the K-8 to model, meaning our fifth grade would, would be moved from our elementary buildings and our two current middle schools, one would become a 5-6 building and the other would become a 7-8 building. As part of that process, administration included 
approximately $5 million in staffing needs or priorities, which would be phased in over the course of the next three years, beginning next year in the 24-25 budget cycle. I also think it's important to emphasize that these staffing costs were included as part of the financial options that were publicly presented this past fall. And those same financing options are included as part of the long range plan. And so there was um, great forethought given to what we anticipated as staffing needs, including priorities, as well as positions essential to realignment and then looked at those needs collectively and systematically and methodically phased them in over the course of three years in a way that made sense in terms of the need for the position and also financially in terms of strategically um, phasing in those additional finances over the course of several years. And so to begin with, and that's just the background in terms of the rationale for these two positions. Um, and now I'm going to invite um, Jen Carolla to come and speak to us specifically about the counselor. And so you'll see in these next two positions, we're going to address both on the short term, meaning the next three years, how we envision these positions would be critical to our district. And then also the longer term vision in terms of with the realignment, how these positions fit into that plan. Good evening, as Dr. Campbell stated, the proposal for the budget priority of a school counselor for next year is in preparation for our realignment, but we also see a tremendous need in the short term to allow for additional supports in serving our students within the district. So the short term vision for this person would be that they would support secondary VESPA students grades six through 12, approximately 163 students as that fluctuates through the year. In addition, the school counselor would provide a resource to provide greater equity in the delivery of services at the middle level. Currently, we have three counselors in both of our middle schools, and the ratio is approximately one to 355 at our Lower McCungee building and one to 273 students at our IRA building. This counselor in the short term would provide additional tier two and tier three level interventions and supports to students at Lower McCungee High School, participate in the MTSS core team meetings and uh, also supports that, are, that come out as a result of those meetings and assist the building with the collection of career readiness artifacts and the delivery of lessons. We currently do have an individual serving in this capacity, and that was done through a PCCD grant that we were awarded this year. That was a one-year position, and so that will conclude at the end of the school year. So we have been able to see some benefits in terms of slightly reducing the number of students on secondary counselor caseloads, because once a student enrolls in our VESPA program, that student transitions from the building school counselor's caseload to our VESPA secondary counselor. Um, in addition, we have seen students already on the caseload of, of the individual at Lower McCungee Middle School serving students who may be requiring those tier two or tier three um, additional intensive interventions. In preparation for realignment, we are proposing that we move to four school counselors per building. So four at the five, six center and, five, and four at the seven, eight center. At this point in time, we are only requesting one of those contracts as a priority for the 24, 25 school year. If you look to the right in the in the graph there, you will see the projected counselor ratios. If we, if we staff four counselors in each of those buildings, and those numbers are based on moderate enrollment projections that we've been given for the 27-28 projected uh, school year. Staffing the buildings in that way will allow us to create increased teaching of pro-social behaviors at a really critical developmental stage in those middle school years. In addition, the counselors are really an integral piece to the proposed house system that we are proposing in those buildings. And that house system, as a reminder, is intended to increase the student and adult connections and make the buildings feel smaller. It's also meant to develop stronger relationships of adults that follow students through to create more continuity of support. 
and it contributes overall to establishing a culture of belonging for all students in the building. And, and our final priority for the upcoming school year is an assistant principal. In the short term, this position would support the administrative responsibilities um, that is currently upon our sole administrator for the elementary principal um, in each building. Specifically, we would focus this position in the short term for our larger elementary buildings. Um, when we think about our larger elementary buildings, currently we have a, an elementary dean who does some pseudo administrative, who has a pseudo administrative role or responsibility. That position has been supported through ESSER funds. Um, this position, this assistant principal or administrative position would help to support administrators. Again, when we think about larger buildings, um, Shoemaker, Willow Lane, West Coastville is one of our other large buildings. The primary responsibility of this individual, when we talk about what does it mean to support with the administrative responsibilities, that includes items such as, but not exclusively limited to, supporting our school-wide positive behavior systems that we have at all seven elementary schools, um, including supporting the administrator with student discipline, reinforcement of appropriate behaviors, supporting as well teacher and staff supervision, and also being a critical part of those multi-tiered system of supports, those meetings that um, occur with each of our grade levels at the elementary level. Then as we think ahead to the realignment for the 27-28 school year, this administrative position would then transfer and be an assistant principal at one of the two middle schools, likely the five, six building. What this would create is an equitable situation in each middle level building, the five, six and the seven, eight building in which we would have a building administrator or principal and two assistant principals at each of those buildings. Um, you just heard Ms. Carolla talk to um, the vision that we had articulated back in the fall in terms of creating smaller house systems within each of our proposed five, six and seven, eight building to focus on establishing those um, positive relationships and connections between students and adults. And so again, this position would then be a critical part of that long-term vision. At this point, my team and I um, open up to the board for any questions that you might have about the priorities. Thank you, Dr. Campbell and team. Are there any questions from the board? Mr. Jankowski. Thank you um, again for the, for the presentations, both last week and this week and, and laying out the priorities and, and the support for them. Um, you know, I, I very much recognize the importance of each of these positions and, and, and what the value that they'll serve. My, my concern is the 5% tax increase and, and the delta between having all of these versus not and that's a big, that's a big, that's a big bill for our taxpayers. Um, what I'm looking for is a way to balance these needs versus the impact on our taxpayers. Um, is there is there a a method in which you could envision this being phased in? Like for example, the two positions that are going to be needed for realignment. And, and maybe waiting and phasing those in in a year or two and and whether we can phase in some of the other positions over the next year or two um, so that we don't have this massive hit all at once um, and I understand again the sensitivity I, I, I truly appreciate the need for all of these but but I'm wondering if there's a way we can be be better balance that need versus the, the, the impact it's going to have. I'm going to take an initial shot at that one, and then I'm looking to Mr. Saul to um, perhaps add another perspective. Um, and I will share that um, as we articulated, 
as we looked at the realignment, um, the realignment plan, we really did our very best job to be comprehensive in terms of thinking about the priorities of the organization, as well as thinking about which of those positions were essential to the effective realignment over the next several years. And so as I described collectively, those items, all of which really are priorities are essential to ultimately supporting our students totaled about $5 million. And so we actually did just that in terms of looked at and calculated how we might strategically over the next several years, and we said three years because again, the proposed timeline is that we would have 24, 25, 25, 26, and 26, 27 to continue with our planning. And then 27, 28 is the potential year in which the realignment might go into effect. And so we did take those $5 million of staffing needs and attempted to divide them up evenly among the three years. And so, you know, your question of, in an, and it's, it's certainly a logical one, in an effort to alleviate the tax burden for next year, could we defer those positions to future years? And I would just, um, I'm probably stating the obvious to the board, be mindful of the fact that that really potentially increases the tax burden in future years as well. Um, and again, I'll ask Mr. Saul maybe to, to comment a little bit more just in terms of the implications that it does have in terms of the long range plan. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Campbell said, um, when we put together the um, phase in plan for the, the realignment option, we had taken a look at um, several areas of operating expenses and primarily including staffing and the tra additional transportation costs. And again, I'm sort of repeating well, what she said, but we phased the uh, staffing in over three years. And part of that plan was to use funds from the capital reserve fund. So as we've been talking about, um, realistically speaking, if we were to eliminate some of the positions from the budget in order to maintain the phasing plan, we should actually be increasing the, the contribution to capital reserve because we have decreased that in order to fund the positions. If we're not funding them this year and we want to maintain the ability to fund them in a future year, we should be increasing the contribution to capital reserve and preserving that, that capability. Um, so what that, what that really says is the 5% is really be, being driven by a lot of the other um, underlying factors, uh, transportation, wage increases, and the other things. If that if that makes sense. No, absolutely. And 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 trust me, I you know I think we all recognize the need for the work, the the additions, the changes that we voted on in the fall. I mean, we're we're falling. Our kids are falling out of our buildings. We need to get that done. Um, so there's the there there's a cost to that. Um, I'm just also recognizing that you know increasing the baseline. The tax base by five percent as a new baseline is, is a lot. So, um, so again, it's not an easy. It's you know, it's not an easy problem. Um, so, just you know, ho hopefully, you know, we'll be we'll be presenting the the proposed final budget at our next meeting. I'm, I'm just hoping there's a way that you can sharpen your pencil, what's left of it, even even more. Um, by the next meeting, um, that we're not looking at a five percent increase, but 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 I, I do appreciate recognize the, the cost and and you know where where we are today with inflationary prices and everything. I mean it's it's not a good time to be building, but but, but we do need to be building. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Ms. Bowman. Um, yeah, I actually just have a bunch of small um, questions trying to understand different um, estimates that you have. The six IAs moving from part-time to full-time, is that estimate also including the benefits that they'll be receiving that they weren't receiving before? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, that's good. Uh, I'm happy to see that. Um, and then in the 
the high school one, the English, but this is a global question about both English and math. Um, and I don't remember what our current class sizes are, although I know I have that information, but I don't have it in front of me. Um, you gave us averages and um, I think it would be actually more helpful to know the worst case scenario. Like what is our um, largest class in both of those topics? And then what would it be under the new plan? So for instance, for English this year, um, our Honors English 9 class is averaging 30 students. Our Honors English 11 class is averaging 31. Now we did make that decision that our Honors classes would run higher than our on-level classes or our current GP classes. Um, unfortunately, our Algebra 1 class this is, classes this year are averaging 27.5. That's because we had students that might have um, moved from honors algebra one into algebra one. We had quite a few move-ins, um, mostly ninth graders this year. Uh, almost 100 ninth graders just moved in over the summer after the schedule was built. Majority of those students landed in an algebra one class. Um, and then of course we had our reseeders. So students who did not pass the course the previous year have to get receded if they didn't take our summer school or our after school offerings. So, um, so there's some pretty big numbers that we'd like to see reduced for the learning um, for the best impact of our kids. Okay, so that so right now our biggest classes in English are around 30, 31 students, and in math, 27, 28 students. Yes, and so you're hoping to see those those come down by about. I'm sorry, because I don't have apples to apples to compare it to. Like, are you looking at two students per class? So um, for instance, in algebra right now, we're running 27, 28. We're hoping that's an on-level algebra class. We're hoping to get that down to 24. Our honors classes are running 30, 31. In English right now, we'd like to get that down to around 28. And it doesn't sound like a, like two or three, four students it isn't a lot, but it really is when you're trying to provide individualized instruction, feedback on writing, sitting down with students, trying to figure out where they went wrong in a math problem. It, you know, that does make a big impact. Um, so 28 average or 28 largest? Average. Okay. Average, because it does depend on what other courses students choose. We can't guarantee a perfect um, because it, it depends on how many kids are choosing other courses and what combination of those courses. So that would be an average. Um, I, I feel like the numbers on, on the one column of what it's going to be, I have average numbers and on what you just talked about, I have largest, so they're not comparing to each other. I'm sorry, those are average. I'm sorry, those are average class sizes. So the 30.14 30 is the average honors English 9 class this year. 31.00 is the average honors English 11 class this year. 27.5 is the right. average algebra one class this year. So that means we have some classes where the a teacher might have 35 kids. That we don't have any at 35, but we do have some over 30 for sure. Okay. All right, that's helpful. Um, I'll make a quick comment on that. I, I do feel like, and, and I know this was a, a controversial vote, but um, when we moved into the co-teaching model, I I think the, the educators deserve our support there to bring these class sizes down. Um, so I'm very much in support of doing this for both subjects for that reason. And also I, I when uh, we always hear people talking about school competition and, um, you know, you hear like Moravian Academy, I think their largest class size is 18, but um, they're also spending twice as much per student on that. So, um, but I, I like to see that we're moving in that direction. I, I know we won't be able to get to uh, private school levels for that reason. Um, okay. Okay, and then I, I did have a question I think um, Mr. Saul sort of answered this for me, but I just want to make sure I understand it. These last two positions that are being um, moving towards realignment, are we initially paying for them with the bond or are we paying for them by, with money that would have gone into the capital reserve but now isn't? Um, 
the the second thing you said, okay. um, the, the the funds that would have gone into capital reserve are being used to fund the positions in year one. Okay. Right. And then in year two, there's additional tax revenue to continue to support um, those positions. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. good. I just wanted to make sure we weren't paying for them with the bond. N no, we would not. I, sorry to cut in, but uh, there's, I can't think of any scenario where we would fund positions with, with debt servant. Okay. Okay. That's great. Um, and then the assistant principal position, you had mentioned there's an elementary dean that's performing some of those duties under the ESSER funds, but now we're gonna bring in the assistant principal. Are, is that making the ESSER funded position redundant? That the ESSER funded position is not being continued for next year. Okay, okay, that's, that's good to know. I think that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowen. Dr. Whitney? Yeah, so um, I just want to be sure I understand this. Um, so you mentioned, as we know, about $5 million of new staffing that was identified for the realignment plan. And what we have here is a total of well, two positions around 300000 So is that, in my understanding correctly, is that in the next two years, we would expect an additional $4.7 of new staffing coming down the line? Um, I will, and I, I'm going to also, not to put on the spot, Mr. Smith and or Mr. Jankowski, who were who were board members who participated in many of our um, facility planning conversations, but we were really fortunate to have board members who encouraged us to kind of think strategically over the next couple of years, and as we prepare for the realignment, plan for positions that we needed as part of the effective transition to the realignment. And then also think forward, think of those positions perhaps that were currently being funded that we saw as critical components of our program, i.e. our interventionists. And so the, the $2 million that you see is, is about 2 million of the 5 million over the next three years. That includes new positions for the realignment. And also I'm gonna say some priority positions that are critical K to 12, not just to support realignment. And so it's about $2 million um, this year, about 1.5 next year, and then 2.4 the following year. That's helpful. Thank you. And so in a sense, all of these are related to the realignment. Correct. Great. If, may I say, or at least related to the millage phase in plan in which we contemplated these positions. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so on a couple other smaller questions, I guess, well, this one is maybe isn't small, but on the autistic support. Um, so clearly the situation is, uh, as you said, there's, we're looking at a net gain of seven students next year. Uh, do we anticipate that's going to be the number every year? Is that an outlier? What, how do we see that number? Because obviously that's one position. Yeah, we've had um, a steady um, enrollment of students in our autistic support classrooms um, entering from early intervention over the past few years. Um, however, we were losing those three students in our fifth grade to the middle school. Um, and as students age up through the program, they will also be aging up through the program. So we anticipate more students leaving next year as well. Right. Okay. But every year, the net. There, where it's a net gain essentially every year. Is that what is that fair to say? It's it's been consistent over the last few years, yes. And so maybe just help me understand, and maybe others too, um, I should know this, but what happens if we cannot fulfill based on the maximum caseload of eight per classroom? What happens if we don't have this the proper staffing to fill those or to to teach those classes and we have extra students that don't fit in our staffing, what, what happens? Yeah, so in that 
um, circumstance, we are required to honor their IEP and what their needs are. So if we're unable to do so within the district, we would then have to look at programming outside the district, which is more costly. So my next question, it's fair to say that that's a more costly option than hiring a teacher. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yes, and I had a question about the benefits of full-time IAs, which you answered. So this, these would be non-benefit positions that would be moving to benefit positions, but that's included in this in these costs. So, Correct. I mean, I'm looking at the numbers, and you know, this is it's, it's eleven thousand per person uh, going from part-time to full-time. That seems like pretty good bang for the buck in my money. Um, I know you said we're not going to make all 155 positions full-time, but um, that seems like a fairly reasonable price tag based on some other positions. Um, I, I, I would dare say I would almost be in support of, of additional part-time to full-time positions uh, maybe this year and every year. I mean, it just 11,000 a piece. Am I, am I reading that right? That's, uh, that's the price tag, right? For converting somebody from part-time to full-time. I mean, I mean, I'm sure you can use all you can get, right? I know it's, it's a six additional hours a week, but that adds up. I mean, how many, I guess, how many would you envision ultimately of those 155 in an ideal world? How many do you think should be full-time? Our, our special education team would really have to do that thorough analysis. And I can, I, I don't want to quote a number in, in sure. public and not have a good handle on that, but we can certainly take a look at that. Sure. Thanks. And then on the English and math uh, teacher, one new position for each. I know, uh, I assume you've <laughs> answered this in the proposal, but uh, we would have the classroom space for these additional teachers. Yes. 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 <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Good. I know that's an issue. And uh, one other question on those positions. Um, thank you. Sorry. Do you envision these positions? What what level do you envision these positions teach? Would these be AP teachers? Would these be? Yes. So it does depend on our tallies, and we would look to to get the biggest bang for our buck in um, the math department. I will say that we would like to prioritize algebra and build those foundational and critical skills um, in algebra one and algebra two. And similarly, we would probably focus on algebra or English nine and English ten the two courses leading into the Keystone exams. But again, it is driven by numbers and requests. Right. So you mentioned reseedings and move-ins. Again, mm -hmm. what is the, I mean, we have move-ins, but I'm sure we also have move-outs, right? What is, what is the sort of average net gain of students or inflow of students? You know, I have the inflow of students. I have the numbers of move-ins, but I do not have the numbers of, for the last year, how many students have moved out. Um, but, but but it's a gain every year. Absolutely, yeah, okay. definitely. Um, uh, let's see, I feel like I know. Oh, I was uh, one more question. Sorry, average class sizes for AP in English and math. You said honors, but that, does that include AP or? Um, I don't have the AP numbers. Um, I can certainly look that up for you real quick. Um, Would you say they're? Comparable though to they're comparable to the honors level. We were we were absolutely seating those classes higher in order to prioritize the younger students and the Keystone feeding courses. Um, so we definitely kept our honors and AP classes higher between twenty eight and thirty. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I, I think that's all the questions I have. I would guess I would just make one final comment, which is to echo uh, Mr. Jankowski, which is to say that a five percent tax hike is a little unpalatable, um, but at the same time, I mean, I'm looking at the overall picture here and um, the picture that's been painted uh, appears to be one of a relatively acute crisis of staffing. And if that's the case, we have an obligation to do all we can. My concern in looking ahead, and if I'm looking at numbers correctly, these are not going to go down. And I guess my concern is that are we now in a landscape of 5% tax increases every year? And I think we need to be straightforward about that if that's the case, because if it is, that's a big ask. I'm not sure it's one that our district can bear, but we may have to. So if, if, the, if this is the landscape, because it appears to me, all these staffing positions, this 
to me, in my eyes, it looks like we're flooding the zone here, but I'm also hearing the justifications and I'm hearing the numbers and it sounds like we're barely making a dent. And that's a situation that I think we need to be very clear eyed about. Just that's all I'll say. Okay, thank you for those comments, Dr. Whitney. Uh, Ms. Ford, did you have a question? I did. I had two, if that was okay. Uh, first, I wanted to just thank you for the paper. I'd like to um, hear a little more about what you think will be the impact for not adding the additional psychologist. Because my other thought was um, not having that individual, uh, what's the impact to the students, but also what is the impact to the person who is currently holding it all down um, because if we don't address it now, eventually my thought is what happens to the students who aren't really receiving the services that they need because we don't have, um, adequate personnel, adequate staffing. So if you could speak to that a little bit, um, and I'll give the second question after that, if you'd like to answer that first. Sure. So we currently have 1.5 positions of a school psychologist at the high school, um, which one of those is currently not filled. It is a shared position between the high school and Albertus Elementary School. Um, there has been a national and statewide shortage of school psychologists, and it has hit the Lehigh Valley pretty roughly. Um, this school year and last school year, uh, we currently have just one full-time school psychologist at Emmaus High School who um, is trying to hold it together um, with the amount of special education evaluations that we've seen, um, especially this school year. And as we have been reevaluating our special education department and looking at how we re how we are providing testing for students who already qualify for special education services and their reevaluations to get updated testing as students transition um, onto adult adulthood post-graduation and what their needs and services may look like, um, whether it's in a community college, a trade school, a four-year university, or on-the-job training. Um, so that school psychologist is not only tasked with all of that testing currently, but also is pulled in many different directions um, through mental health crisis um, and behavioral crises that are occurring at Emmaus High School as well. Thank you. That, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And I think that the community will appreciate hearing those details um, when they hear the 5%, you know, like I said, it may cause angst, but if there's something that's gonna help our students and that's going to um, alleviate some of the pressure. I'm in support of that. Um, my second question was very uh, similar to Mr. Whitney's. I, I just wanted to know if you had a percentage or a number of the um, 155 instructional assistants, uh, uh, assistants, if you could, if you don't have that now at some point, share that information um, because it sounds like for what it costs, it sounds like it would be a win-win in terms of consistency of servicing um, our students. It would make sense to me to have someone that's in full-time employment uh, is going to service the students and make scheduling easier. So I definitely would like to hear what that number is or what the percentage is of the 155. And that was it. That's all I had. Thank you again for the presentation and Thank information. You. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Smith? Yeah, I just had a couple of things um, after listening to the conversation uh, tonight. Um, Mr. Saul had mentioned the Millage Phasing Plan. Um, I very quickly went back and uh, pulled up um, some of the, the documents we've reviewed Regarding the, the facilities plan, I went back to just popped up October 23rd when we first looked at um, different um, options. Do you happen to recall, Mr. Saul, what scenario we went with um, for that millage phase of the plan? It's labeled scenario six. Scenario six. With um, a total cost of 66167 
Okay. It, it is, I will share, it is now included in the um, long range plan in the supplemental information okay. section. So, um, and just so that people don't dig through it like, like I was, um, I know you have it over there in front of you. Um, column 15, um, what are we looking at just for uh, debt service and operations millage increases, just for that alone? Going back to Dr. Whitney's question earlier about five uh, percent every year. Column fifteen or column thirteen? Uh, the the, the percent, millage the, the increase percentage. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. sorry. That yeah. well, mine is column thirteen. Okay. Uh, for the current year, it's one point one four percent, and it, you know, in in the following years, it it declined slightly. One point one three point one point one three percent. One point one one percent. Okay. Uh, but it's at least one percent for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, and that's just for debt service and just for operations um, for for that part of the of the plan. Just to clarify, yes, debt service, and when you say operations, to clarify, that's the staffing and transportation costs, as well as anticipated operation safety. Okay. Um. So when I hear that, I. I I hope that uh, you know, obviously nobody has a crystal ball other than what our numbers can kind of predict for us, but I hope that the 5% is um, every year is not going to come to fruition. Um, the other question that I had, um, and I was actually um, happy to, to uh, hear us uh, learn about the, the challenges that we have right now with uh, finding or fully staffing our, our current psychologists um, that is a, and correct me if I'm wrong, a position that is, um, there's a lot of movement from district to district because there's not a lot of supply to meet the demand. Um, so my my thought in, in knowing that, having in the back of my, my, my mind, I'm looking at um, the, the presentation tonight where we're looking at 117 for a new psychologist, also knowing that we are currently looking for a psychologist and now we're effectively making two openings for ourselves and we can't fill the one. Um, when I see the 117 and keeping that in the back of my mind of those two open decisions now, um, I'm, I'm assuming that that 117 reflects our current um, salary benefits package that we're, we're providing to our psychologists in-house. Um, I have a concern that, and this is not something that I don't think anybody has the answer to right now, but I have a concern that um, for that position specifically, since it is so hard to fill and knowing that some districts will um, have their psychologists be part of the Act 93 group um, in order to retain and attract um, more talent. I, I'm concerned that the the 117 that we have there is not gonna be enough um, to fill uh, both those positions. But it's not, it's you know, obviously we're budgeting for one, but we really have two to fill. So. I'm I'm wondering if there is a uh, potential hidden budgetary impacts in the future if we um, stop and take a look at okay how are we going to fill it do we need to adjust our salary package our benefits package for um, the 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 psychology position down the line nothing that we're talking about right now it's just something that in the back of my mind looking ahead of the future um, we may need to need to consider so um, no real expectation of of answers here on that but it's just something that i want to just put out there as something may, may i just comment on Absolutely. it actually, since you brought it up um for positions like this and and, and i agree there could be a time that that cer there certainly needs to be what i'll call a major adjustment but um for positions we've actually positioned uh, that 117 reflects placement at the master's level step seven which is sort of a law of averages so some people we will hire bachelor's one uh, some people will buy higher at, you know, master's 16. Um, so what we've done is we've looked at that and said, okay, law of averages, we budget master's level seven. So I agree with you. Certainly we may need to hire a school counselor at a higher level. The offset of that is we may hire um, another position at bachelor's one. Um, so, so over the years, like it, it sort of, works itself out at the end of the day. Yeah. Again, remember what I said in opening, there certainly may come a time where there needs to be a more significant adjustment of the positions, uh, and I recognize that. 
Yeah, I'm wondering if hear you say that, maybe, maybe specific to the psychologist position, uh, maybe the counselors as well, depending on what the, the supply is looking like there. But um, in terms of attracting experienced talent, maybe we consider not budgeting at master's step seven. Maybe we do look at budgeting for higher up, you know, some, some, maybe look at, at 16 because to have somebody come from one district to, to ours, you know, and they, they're, they're bringing with them um, 10, 15 years of experience um, for, for something that's probably not very, not really public knowledge, but um, when, when, when teachers are moving from district to district, it's, they're not necessarily guaranteed. And that's a pretty um, standard practice that they're going to have all of their, uh, their years of experience entering at that same level, depending on the contract and from one district to the other. So um, knowing that that's negotiable, I'm wondering if, you know, saying, hey, you know, we'll, we'll take you for all, all of your years of experience, getting somebody to, to attract from another district saying, hey, we'll take it at 16 when you have 16 years of experience, maybe that's something that's worth uh, being realistic about and, and budgeting for rather than seven. So if I could respond to that, two thoughts, um, and I'll put a little plug in here in terms of advertising for positions. Um, I'm really proud to say that East Penn, it is our standard hiring practice in which we do honor years of contracted service to teachers who have taught in a public school in state. Um, so, you know, if we have an individual coming, as you're describing, with 15 years of experience, in, in a public school in Pennsylvania, we honor that as well as their, their degree. Um, I think as well, I just wanted to respond to your, your reflection. And I think these are the kinds of conversations that district leadership across the Commonwealth and potentially across the country is now almost forced to begin having in terms of um, recognizing the shortage in, in teachers as well as other certification areas and, and just beginning to think about how we might expand our current practices so that we can attract high quality individuals to positions for which there just really aren't many candidates lately. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Additional comments? Ms. Bowman? Yeah, um, just a follow up to Mr. Smith's comments, because um, I guess I'm not really sure I understand why um, this would necessitate pretty big tax increases for the next couple of years. Um, or is this year mostly as big as it is because most of the positions on here are not related to the realignment? In the current year, we have a number of underlying factors. Um, the transportation contract of 20%. Okay. Um, wages, which are tied to Act 1 index, which are higher presently. Um, off the top of my head, I, you know, I, I'm not thinking of the other things, but we've talked about them, about the economic pressures that are really pushing this year. In terms of the millage phase-in plan, uh, as I said earlier, when Mr. Smith asked me, I mean, it's really, it's it's 1.1%. 1, 1. 1 and we knew that that 1.1% 1. 1 would be on top of whatever else was pushing the, the, you know, the annual costs. Um, so then, I mean, if, if we continue to see strong inflationary um, pressures for another 12 months, I can't guarantee that we won't be here in a similar situation. What I can say is our $8 million um, annual transportation contract, we know that's gonna be 3% now moving forward. It, it has readjusted in the 20%. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's just a lot of underlying factors really putting a lot of pressure on um, on the budget this year. Okay, so and so that I'll also just give one more clarification to that: so the two million dollars in proposed priorities for the upcoming school year um, were planned for, and and the impact on the tax increase for those two million dollars it's not attached to whether the positions are for part of the realignment and or other identified priority needs in the organization. They're ultimately part of that $2 million. 
Um, so next year, theoretically, obviously you have the part of the budget that sticks and um, so it makes it difficult to answer this question, but um, other than the, that inflationary part of the budget that, that um, includes all of the wage increases and increases in um, health care costs and things like that, um, we could theoretically only on top of that have a 1.13% increase. Yes, I mean, that's what the millage phase in plan contemplates. So, yes. Okay. Um, and that even includes the additional staff that are allocated toward the realignment, or does it not include that staff? The, I'm sorry, I don't remember the number, but the, I think it was 5 million that you're phasing oh, in. Yes, for sorry. Three years. Yeah, yeah it's, about one, it's about 1. 1.5 next year, I believe. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And that's included in, I think you gave the number 1.13% increase for the, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, that's helpful. Um, I, I did have just a, an overall comment. I was trying to do some quick math here, and it, it looks like about half of these costs are related to special education, and um, the other big chunk of them are related to problems that we're trying to solve that are related to the pandemic. And really, um, a small portion are related to um, what we're hoping to do with the middle schools. And, you know, I, I, we're just in a, a situation here where um, a lot of issues with our schools are intersecting at once that's causing a really expensive solution. But um, I don't, I really don't see how we shave too much off of this and still provide um, a good educational experience for our kids and also a good uh, work experience for our staff. So. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate that it's this much, but I, I really hope that um, when we come in coming years, we won't see this again. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Any other comments? Actually, uh, Ms. Bowman's uh, questioning actually leads into the perspective points that I wanted to make. Um, so, you know, I, I, I Maybe being optimistic, I do tend to look at what is happening going into this year as uh, you know potentially unique circumstances. I mean, we, I mean, we've had a lot of inflationary pressures that have you know forced an increase in, in transportation costs. Um, you know, other things are driving up. I'm hoping that stuff will eventually abate. In which case, then these these cost increments that 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 will happen year over year are already more or less absorbed in, into the budget and we won't actually have higher contributions to, to the, the increase. So, you know, taking a step back, I'm also concerned with 5%. I'd like to see that be, be less, but understand that, that, that we have a unique set of circumstances and trying to do a lot of different things this year and react to conditions that, that are sort of out of our control, but also we're also trying to bring in things that are part of it. So, I guess I'm somewhat optimistic that we might not be boxed into having to see 5% every year uh, for, for the reasons I was just saying that, you know, some of the cost pressures that are forcing the increase this year will hopefully abate next year. Uh, one wild card that I, that I I don't want to forget, and I'm hoping that our, our uh, people in Harrisburg don't either, is the the state funding increments that, that they're supposed to help schools with, with, with their with their funding eventually is going to hit once they agree on what the plan is and that's going to make an impact on our budgeting and perhaps alleviate some of this put this cost or budget pressure that that we're looking on um, potentially looking at um you know I, I do think that you know in these last few years uh we you know we, we've been we've been funding you know ESSER funded positions that are meant to to you know help address some of these pandemic related issues that are here um, and we've been working these last couple of years to try to absorb them in, into the budget because we've seen the value and we've seen the impact. I'm hoping that, that we're kind of at the end of that. Again, so it doesn't necessarily drive the priorities and we can focus our priorities more on what, what's necessary for getting ready for, for the realignment aspect so that next year when we talk about this again, our priorities are really 
focus and, and, and perhaps you know to, to the minimum that's needed to satisfy realignment as opposed to bringing in all these other things that we've been concerned about. Um, one thing too is that you know just to say you know why do we want to bring this these things in this year and perhaps take a larger hit this year is that we have the space within the work. I'm just thinking practically about how we're going to, how these how the the, the funding or the, the tax increases work relative to the, the adjusted equity index. You know, the, 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 the theoretical this year was 6.2%. I'm glad we're not there, um, but we have, but that was providing space for districts to kind of handle these things. I don't know, I don't think we're necessarily gonna have that in subsequent years. So, you know, if, if we're trying to fund these other things that, that we agree upon that are needed by the district, we may not have the the cap space to work within. So we have to take some 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 of that now. Um, so for instance, if we didn't start some of these positions, I do agree with Mr. Saul that we probably need to have to bank some of that anyway and be part of our our uh, you know what, what we're spending. But in the meantime, if we can hire some of these positions instead of just saving the money, we do have a short-term benefit that we've identified as part of the presentation and where we can spread it around to where we think need for things and invest or the extra supports in the, in the middle schools or the high school or the elementary schools. So we actually get some value uh, to, again, you know, as Ms. Bowen alluded to, probably having, you know, system, you know, creating some relief for the rest of our staff and making sure that students are succeeding and their jobs are made easier. So, you know, you know, none of this is, is is easy to necessarily you know, digest, but I think that there is a solid rationale by which what we're looking at. Um, I do hope that we can get some greater clarity from, from Harrisburg in terms of what their funding situation is going to be before we adopt the final budget in June, uh, so that 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 could you know, actually you know kick in some additional funds and bring that that that, that millage increase and that tax increase down lower. Um, so again, you know, I appreciate this discussion. I do share the overall concerns. I just wanted to make sure that I made the point that that perhaps next year will look a little bit better. Um, but again, you know, it's. I think when we do look at the priorities next year, we, we try to avoid, uh, you know, creating a situation where we have this year where we have something that's a, that, that, that that's abnormally high from a historical perspective. Okay, that was a mouthful. Um, any other comments or questions from the board on this, uh, I guess, part A of the budget discussion? All right, well, moving on, we have a budget update from Mr. Saul. So I'll try to be brief. However, I do have um, 24 slides. So, um, but I am going to, you know, really, this really is intended to be an update. Um, we're not gonna go through the long range plan the way we did previously. We've gone through that, but I do wanna highlight the changes and um, just talk about some of the, the uh, revisions to the budget. So you have a sense of um, where the budget has been impacted. Um, so we have a priority presentation done, time for the budget update. Uh, I distributed to the board two documents this time. Um, so you received the long range uh, capital and fiscal plan, um, which we have been looking at. But I also provided to you a document called the PDE or Pennsylvania Department of Education 2028. This is the prescribed format or the legally prescribed format um, put out by the Pennsylvania Department of Education that every school district across, across the Commonwealth. Um, has to prepare their budget in in order to make it available for uh, the public review as well as board adoption. So we have the format of the long range capital plan because it works better for our planning purposes, but we still are required to prepare the PDE 2028. The PDE um, 2028 is really one dimensional. Um, it, it, it shows the year of the budget being developed only. So it's a one year snapshot. 
Um, we have traditionally included some supplemental schedules to go along with the PD 2028. Um, and we have actually revised those this year to give additional information um, and make it more, uh, to give more comparative data, if you will. Um, so the supplemental um, information includes a summary sheet, which has the beginning fund balance, the revenues, expenditures, and ending fund balance, similar to our long range plan. It also has the revenues and the expenditures. It provides three years of actual data and then year includes the prior year budget and actual, and then the current year budget and estimate, as well as the uh, next year or the proposed budget that we're uh, planning. And again, this is laid out consistent with the format of that PDE document. Um, so again, uh, we, we've heard from some community members in the past, hey, it'd be really helpful if we had this additional comparative data it wasn't overly difficult for us to prepare it in this format and put it and make it available. Um, so that's something new this year. The last two pages of that document um, we have traditionally provided, and this is a what I'll call a tracker of the changes that we've made. So from the time that we made the initial expenditure and revenue and fund balance presentations, we're tracking those changes just so you can be aware of, you know, sort of what's what's occurring in terms of, you know, revenues and expenditures and assumptions. I'd like to take just a few minutes to go over the changes we've made. Again, so you have a sense of the, the revisions we've made to the budget, um, where they are and what the impact is. So in that document on page uh, 28 is where I am. I have it on the screen here as well. Um, if you look at the um, current year estimates, uh, we've increased our estimate um, in, um, in terms of reserves by $1.2 million. And I'm just gonna stick a pin in that one for a minute and come back to it when we look at the long range um, fiscal capital plan and talk a little bit about the current year and our estimates for the current year. In terms of the, the year that we're planning, 24-25, um, there's been, as Dr. Campbell said earlier, a revision to the real estate tax rate increase from 5.95% down to 5%. Um, if you look at the documents, you'll actually see 4.99 referenced many places. That was that that just happened. That was not by design. I'm not trying to sell to you or the community that we're under 5%, which is why we're calling it 5% at this point. We're not going for used car financing or anything like that. Um, so we'll refer to it as 5%, but it really does calculate out the 4.99. Um, there was also some revisions to the assessed values. So creating additional um, uh, real estate revenue uh, opportunities there. We made a few adjustments to um, tuition that we received from other um, school, other LEAs or school districts in the Commonwealth, as well as miscellaneous revenue. We also, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes, increased the basic education funding and special education funding assumptions. Again, I'll come back to those. We increased the pupil transportation subsidy because we received the actual subsidy that will, the, the calculation of the actual subsidy we'll be receiving this year, which allowed us to update our projection for next year. We included the PCCD mental health grant and meritorious safety grant. Those are both grants that are actually 23, 24 grants, but the spending period goes into 24, 25, and we've collectively made the decision to actually spend those grants next year, start them at the beginning of the fiscal year and run them in through the year. So we've added the um, revenue for those. We also accounted for um, the state reimbursement for social security and retirement. Again, that's related, that's 50% of our additional costs related to the same things. And then finally, um, an adjustment to federal program revenue, usually around this time of year, we receive an update from the uh, Department of Federal Programs with the Pennsylvania Department of Education saying, hey, your um, federal uh, allocation has been revised for the year, and usually that's the final revision. Um, and so we've received that information and we had a, a slight decrease in the current year, and we always just sort of hold harmless our federal expend or federal funding number 
And so we just made that same adjustment for next year. So just a slight reduction of $4,000. So those are the, um, I was gonna say significant items. Those are actually all of the items on the revenue side that we have adjusted. On the expenditure side, um, we've made a number of adjustments to wages. Um, the first one is uh, teacher miscellaneous uh, teachers miscellaneous adjustments, and really what those are is we've actually had um, retirements and resignations, probably more resignations during the current year. So from the time that we first calculated the the um, expenditure amount until now, this is just the change based on those um, that attrition. The next is um, teachers' retirement savings. And so this is individuals who have already announced their retirement. We've gone in and taken out the salary that they would have received next year and plugged in that master seven, as we talked about earlier, in terms of new employees. So that would be our attritional savings for teacher retirements. Teacher column movement, our teachers have the opportunity to take additional um, course credits and move across the columns in the salary guide. And so this is additional, um, wages for people that we know are moving across the salary guide. Uh, we did, we have now included the ESSER offset fund um, expenditures. So you can see there's an amount there for um, wages related to that, as well as wages related to those PCCD, um, the mental health grant, which I referenced earlier. Also um, wages for security officers. I will just say that this is actually an offset. It was just a movement of funds. We'll talk about this in a few minutes as we move down the list. Um, it was really a movement from sort of a fixed spot in the budget to represent it as wages and benefits. Um, an adjustment of wages for health room nurses, and that was really a reconciliation, again, from the time we had originally um, put the budget together until now and reconciling the number of total positions that we have on the books. Um, administrative assistance, again, due to um, turnover and attrition, both during the current year and projected, I think we have a retirement already for next year. A uh, little tiny adjustment for custodial maintenance. Um, instructional assistance and staff against assistance. Again, that was a just a tight reconciliation of, of the people and the positions and, and the number of positions that we have in total. And then finally, remedial assistance. Um, this is related to um, additional wages relate, um, due to a planned increase in the overall number of hours for academic support assistance, or sometimes referred to as remedial assistance. Um, medical insurance, this is related to the um, ESSER offset funds, so the positions that were added to the budget using offset funds, as well as the PCCD mental health grant, it would be the medical um, benefits related to those positions. Similarly, dental and life insurance would be the same explanation. Um, the FICA contribution, the retirement contribution, and workers' compensation, again, that would be those positions as well as any of the other adjustments and wages because they're wage-based benefits. You can see next the PCCD meritorious grant. Again, that's not wages. The meritorious grant is being used on equipment. Um, so that's, you see that as a street $45,000. And then the ESSER offset funds, um, non-wage expenditures. This is what has been used and is proposed to be used again next year for um, um, contracted behavioral supports. Next is, again, a small adjustment to our federal program expenditures. It's both aligning to the change that we had in the current year, as well as um, part of our federal programs uh, funding that we receive has to go to the uh, non-public schools. And so it's making sure there's an appropriate amount allotted for the non-public non school contribution. Uh, charter schools, we, we always, uh, throughout the budget process, we take a real-time look at what our current year uh, charter school expenditure estimates are. And so this is an adjustment based on, again, where we are at this point in the year related to um, charter expenditures and projecting that forward to next year. Uh, pupil transportation, this is specifically related to the fuel. 
Um, we buy our fuel for um, transportation on the futures market. And so we've been monitoring that market. We actually have not locked in, but the market is down um, from where we have been in the past. And so we're estimating some savings there. So we've already tried to capture that savings. It's pretty, we're watching the market closely, sort of week by week to see. Um, we're, we're, I think we're approaching the time to, to lock in, but there's still the potential for additional savings. Um, the school security expenses, this is the offset to the where we plug the wages in and benefits at the top. And then finally, the technology uh, technology infrastructure, um, 900,000. I'm gonna talk to that again in just a few minutes. So a couple of these things we'll get back to as we proceed. So again, that's sort of an overall, we did a, a very in-depth um, analysis of really every single wage line item, every single um, expenditure line item and to evaluate it, where we are currently, where we're projected to be next year um, and took a hard look again so we could give a realistic um, look to the board in terms of where we are related to the tax increase at this point. Next we'll um, turn to the long range uh, fiscal and capital plan. And again, I'd just like to highlight some of the changes and touch on the things that I um, had put a pin in previously. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the, um, the, the, the estimate for the current year. So previous, so there was a budgeted deficit for the end of the current year of $2.1 million. And that represented the use of the ESSER offset funds from the committed fund balance for the current year. At this point, we're estimating that we will end the year with just a little over $1 million. So that's about a $3 million swing. Administration is recommending setting aside $2 million of that in a committed fund balance to establish a technology infrastructure plan for maintenance and upkeep of our technology infrastructure. And we actually, if you look, turn to page 41, I'll just go to the next slide. Page 41 has a new page that we've added, which is similar to our facilities plan, where we have um, mapped out our expenses over the next several years and sort of calculated how the fund would be funded in order to be able to afford the annual expenditures. So what we're recommending is setting aside Again, $2 million of the of that difference or fund committed fund balance this year, and then $550,000 into the committed fund balance each year thereafter. I, it's important to note that this is not a budgeted expenditure line item. So it's not going to, you're not gonna see the expenditures go up related to this. What it is is at the end of the year when we have that delta between the revenues and expenditures, it's taking part of that delta and assigning it to the to that committed fund balance, similar to what we did with the um, ESSER funds, but assigning it to it and saying, okay, those funds are now committed to be used for technology upkeep moving forward. So now we'll go back to um, page five, which was the, the overview sheet. And I just wanted to give them a reconciliation of the committed fund balance and the um, budget deficit for 24-25. So I have listed on the slide here um, presently the, the, the ending fund balance or the committed fund balance, I should call it, is $1.29 million. We would add an additional $2 million to that committed fund balance overall. In 24-25, we'll be using the money that's still in there for ESSER, the ESSER offset funds. We would then also use $900,000 for um, technology infrastructure expenses. And then at the end of 24-25, we would put in another $550,000. And the ending committed fund balance would be $1.6 million. So that, I just wanted to reconcile. So if you take the... Um, use of the ESSER and the use of the technology, um, the expenses, the nine, uh, the 1.2 million and the 900,000, that should equal the deficit, the budgeted deficit. And 
the 2425 ending balance should match the amount that remains in that committed fund balance. And I have that highlighted in the uh, red square on the, on the screen here. On, I wanna move forward to the revenue section. So on page nine, I just wanted to highlight, and we already talked about this, but that the um, tax rate increase is now at 5%. You can, I said earlier, and you can see it reflected as 4.99, but that's 5%. And then on the next slide, I just wanted to include for um, reference or to highlight um, slide 10 has that 10 year history. And I think it was uh, Dr. Levinson in your closing comments, you talked about the capacity of the Act One Index. And I would just point out in the graph on the top of this, um, you, the straight line is the Act One Index. And you can certainly see how it's much higher this year than it has been in the past years, sort of speaking directly to the fact that there's greater capacity this year than there has been in past years. Keeping in mind that the Act One Index is actually a you know, sort of quasi-economic indicator, um, you know, based on certain economic factors. So it's sort of saying that, or recognizing that there is greater pressure, greater upward pressure presently that hasn't been there in the past. Probably something um, that, that we talk, it's something we do talk a lot about, Actually, Dr. Levinson, again, you you referenced this in your in your comments. Um, the basic education funding and special education funding. As I said earlier, we we increase the basic education and special education funding. On this slide, on the left side, on the top, you see um, a clip from the Pennsylvania Department of Education website with regard to um, funding for 24-25. There are two components to the basic education funding. The first is um, the amount to be distributed through the existing formula. And the second is an adequacy adjustment that would also go through the formula. Um, and then at the bottom, I actually went to the, the Excel document that you can see referenced there and highlighted the adequacy formula amount for you. We have included, if you look in column F, beside the adequacy amount, we have included the total proposed increase for basic education funding. We have not included the proposed adequacy investment. Um, and the reason why, uh, the proposed adequacy investment is a new policy and spending initiative proposed by the governor. At this point, I don't feel that there is um, and certainly I'm open to anybody, you know, opining uh, as well, but um, I don't feel that there's bipartisan support at this time with regard to that adequacy supplement. Um, I will share, and I, I, I don't make this as a political statement, but simply reporting information that I heard last week. Um, last Friday, I attended a, a roundtable meeting with some local legislators and a member of the Senate Republican Caucus stated that the Senate will use funding as a as leverage for other leg legislative priorities and policy matters. Um, so that doesn't give me a lot of confidence about where this adequacy supplement will land. And obviously, if you look at the amount, that could have a significant impact on our overall tax increase. So as much as I would love to say, you know what, let's just put this in here. I just don't have a lot of confidence. You may recall last year, we actually um, took a shot in the dark and had increased our basic education funding. Um, I think the circumstances were different. Um, that was money that was flowing through the formula. Um, we also had um, some other variables in the budget that if we had not received that money, there were ways that we could adjust. I don't feel as comfortable this year in terms of the overall picture and while you gain $1.3 million that we just, I don't believe we can be real certain about. So um, again, I wanted to just editorialize a little bit in terms of the state revenue. Basic, edu uh, sorry, special education funding is a lot more straightforward. Again, with special education, we have plugged in the proposed um, subsidy, the, the governor's proposed subsidy for next year. Um, 
most of the most of the lobby groups related to public education are saying there's a there's a pretty good chance we're at least going to see that basic education and special education subsidy, the base numbers. Again, adequacy adequacy supplement definitely up in the air. Okay, some other updates to the long range plan. On page, on page 23 of the long range plan, which is the capital res, uh, where the capital reserve uh, fund contribution is broken out, we have um, put the calculation there of the amount that the contribution to capital reserve would otherwise be, the amount that is quote being used from capital reserve and then the net amount that we're transferring um, for future years. Similarly, on page 25, um, we've done the same thing for um, debt service. We've broken it out so you can see the existing debt service, the proposed new debt service, as well, as, and then the total debt service that's actually used. Um, again, hoping that by breaking these out, it helps see um, some of the impacts of the, the millage phase and plan. On page 26 of the long range plan, which is the um, budget priorities, we've now included the costing out of the priorities and all of the detail related to those. On page 38, um, we've actually moved the technology plan from the supplemental information section and given it its own place, its own home in the, uh, in the long range plan under technology plan. So it includes, um, all of the um, items, including you know our infrastructure, which we talked about, the devices for uh, staff and students, um, and things like that, uh, which are not uh, you know the usual maintenance that would be included in the um, technology department budget. On page page forty four, which is the scenario analysis. There was a request last time to um, adjust the scenarios, and we've actually uh, provided, as per the request, um, the scenarios of 5%, which is the, the currently proposed tax increase, 3.2%, um, which, as Dr. Campbell said earlier, if the priorities were removed from the budget, we'd be at 3.2%. And then the final one, again, is 1%, 1 which, again, we tend to try to use 1%. Um, because it's easy to uh, so, sort of interpret numbers then. Page 47 is that page where um, our community members can look at the proposed tax increase rates and understand what the impact to their personal situation may be. This is the real estate tax impact of various percentage tax increases in assessed values page. And uh, similar to the um, scenarios, we've made available here 5%, the current um, increase that's included in the budget, 3.2, which is um, if the priorities were removed, and 1%. And the final change to the long-range plan, which we actually referenced earlier on page um, 50 in the supplemental information section, we've included the... Um, millage phase in plan for the K-8 option two realignment so that that's at your fingertips and available for review uh, or comparison. Um, we just figured it would be easier to have it right here available than try to go search for it. That brings us to the end of the update presentation. I just wanted to make a um, you know, one final comment, final thoughts. Um, at the next board meeting on April 22nd, um, we will present the proposed final budget. Um, the reality is I don't believe there will be many changes between what you're looking at this evening and what you'll receive on April 22nd because that would need to be prepared next Monday. I'm not sure a whole lot is gonna happen um, this week. If something changes of significance, we'll certainly make that update, um, but sort of preparing you, um, I'm not sure that there will be significant changes between now and that time. Um, I just want to remind the board that the proposed final budget is really a procedural step in terms of the budget uh, approval process. It must be completed 30 days prior to the adoption of the final budget. Um, 
And the reality is it does not need to reflect um, the final spending plan or the fi final tax rate increase. Um, frankly, all aspects of the budget could change between the adoption of the proposed final budget and the final budget. So again, we'll bring that forward to the board at the next meeting. And with that, I would be happy to entertain any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Saul, for the analysis. Any questions from the board and spots? Mr. Saul, thank you. Mr. Saul, thank you so much, as always, for putting things into, putting complicated things into more um, easily understood terminology. So thank you. Um, also, I would just give you my own appreciation for bringing your expertise and for bringing your um, realistic expectations as to what you think can happen with this. So thank you very much for that. And also thank you for uh, listing out the tax impacts. Hopefully this will help alleviate some concerns because I know you hear percentages thrown around and it sounds like you know these numbers are massive. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Klutz. Additional comments? Okay, hey, well, thank you again for the analysis. Um, uh, again, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. We'll see something on 422 and then uh, perhaps something a little different uh, by June 10th. With that, uh, that concludes this part of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, personnel. I may have a motion to accept the personnel items. So moved. Are there any comments or questions from the board? So none. Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Pelagi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Dr. Levis? Aye. Nine, aye. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, Dr. Campbell, I believe you have some comments. Yes, I just wanted to recognize and congratulate our two retirees who um, appear on this particular agenda, including Deb Kolb is a French teacher at Emmaus High School um, who has served the school district for 22 years as both an outstanding teacher as well as um, an exceptional leader and is certainly shared as she has served as our world language department chair for, for many years um, at the secondary level. And also wish to congratulate Scott Walbert who retires um, after serving in a district for 15 years. And he was um, in his position, he was specifically our lock or door mechanic. And when we think about um, the importance of safety and security and maintaining secure buildings, um, I'll, I'll say this, and I sort of look to my colleagues in the audience, and we mean this in a really respectful way. Scott was really diligent in terms of um, who had master keys and, and maintaining track of those keys. Um, and I will never forget when I took over the superintendency and and he assigned me my master key. And um, there's a huge responsibility and he made sure that I understood that. So, um, but again, we certainly wish Scott much happiness and health in his retirement. Hey, thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, next is business operations. If there are no objections, I'd like to put a motion to take items A through D together. So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from the board? Please see none. Is that please call the roll? Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Dr. Levins? Aye. Nine times. Thank you, Ms. Allen. The next item is curriculum, uh, educational conferences. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Pelegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Dr. Levins? Aye. Nine months. Ms. Allen. Uh, next is policy, uh, second reading. 
I believe there weren't very many changes. So would the administration care to provide a brief mm -hmm. or address any and, and address any questions from the board? Sure, good evening. Um, so there's really just one change uh, to policy 903, which is public comment and board meetings, um, as we discussed here at the last uh, meeting. In the guidelines section under public comment, we changed the language to must direct all comments to the presiding officer instead of the board. Uh, and again, that was based on feedback of the board. And that's that's all the changes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Povletis. Are there any comments or follow-up questions from the board? All right, we'll advance to the third reading. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other educational entities. Uh, we believe we have a report from, from LCTI JOC meeting. Uh, Mr. Jankowski. Yes, thank you. Um, the LCTI Joint Operating Committee met last Wednesday. Um, so it's, interestingly, um, if, if you'll recall, the last update I gave, um, I discussed a, an incident where one of the one of the teachers had um, resuscitated a gentleman who was had a heart attack in the parkway. Well, she gave she had just recently recertified the uh, one of the school security officers in CPR, and he was recently training at a local YMCA for the New York City Navy SEAL swim. And when he went into the locker room, he found a, a gentleman unresponsive and he applied CPR and an AED and resuscitated the man. So it, clearly the trainings are having the impact um, and it was a, a, another feel good story uh, to start the meeting. Um, as to business, um, communities and schools gave their annual update uh, in which they discussed their support model and reviewed their three tiers of support, discussed their impact and progress, um, and, and by all accounts, they seem to be having a, a very positive impact at the school. Uh, it was noted that all participating school districts have approved the 24-25 general operating budget. The 24-25 school year calendar was approved. Um, the administration then reviewed uh, applications and enrollment data for the 24-25 school year. As of March 19th, 1,556 applications for admission were, were received. Um, it's getting to the point now where so only 70% of the student applicants received their first choice program. And the LCTI now has more applicants than seating capacity. Um, if every seat was filled, 180, 188 students would not have a seat. So, I, I mean, that's a good sign, but but also um, recognition that something needs to be done. So uh, the school is developing a process management team to address the wait list, list issue. And each, each school district will have at least one person on, on the team uh, to help figure out how we can make sure all students are getting the opportunity. Um, as a result of uh, excess revenues from the 22-23 fiscal year, uh, we will be receiving a credit adjustment to our May billing, a couple hundred thousand dollars. And on March 22nd, the school hosted fifth graders and 3,700 students showed up for the tour. So that bodes well. And hopefully the process management team can find enough seats to build the future uh, students. And that is my report. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Quickly, you said that a couple hundred thousand dollars, is that for East Penn or is that- For East Penn, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Just May I interject? What's it's about $16,000, I remember correctly. Uh, it's, yeah. I'm wondering if that couple hundred thousand is collectively for everybody. It sounds more. They had a line item for each school. So, I mean, I defer to you. I don't, yeah. yeah. But, I'll double check. Yeah. Maybe LCTI is keeping some of it. <laughs> so maybe I better look better into, look into it. that. We'll take the higher number. Just so yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the report. Uh, moving on, there are no other items, so I'll move on to announcements. We had an executive session this evening where we talked about matters related to litigation and real estate. 
Our next regular board meeting is on Monday, April 22nd, uh, here in this room at 7.30 p.m. Uh, with that, no further business, uh, I'd like to get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Meeting adjourned. Good evening. Uh, Utah or Purdue? Aye. Aye.